Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Cadence with Frank Schirmeister, who's going to talk today about which verification engine you should use and when you should use it. Frank, there are a lot of choices in terms of verification engines that you can use. Right. When do you use which one and how do you know? Well, there's a choice from very early on where you have pure virtual engines. People even start with modeling some of the hardware completely independent of the hardware. And then you typically have, on the dynamic front, simulation at higher levels of abstractions, RTL simulation, emulation, prototyping. And then you do extend verification to the actual prototypes on the chip. Software development, just as important for chip development these days, happens on those as well. And all of them have different advantages and disadvantages over time, and that's what we're going to talk about. Does it change depending upon what node you're at, what market you're going after? Oh, yeah, a little bit. So um, the, the engines um, are suitable for different design sizes, typically. So in a case of a very small design, like an edge node, my fitness tracker, very small microcontroller, um, you may not need the same type of ammunition in terms of engines as for the latest GPU and AI chip. So it's definitely depending on application domain, domains and design size. Why don't you draw this out for us? Builder? So Frank, why don't you draw us out how this actually transpires in terms of a, an actual design? Okay, we'll do. So let's look at a timeline um, of a chip design and the associated hardware software development. So if I look at the timeline, you have the idea of, um, this is my little light bulb, uh, Mr. Addison, I'm uh, having my idea of what I'm going to develop, and I want it to be at the end a piece of silicon, which at the end is um, part of a board, so this goes into my product, and it has a lot of software on top of it, typically, on the chip. So in between, how do I get there? Well, there are a couple of engines we look at from a verification perspective in the spectrum from your idea to the actual silicon at the end of the day. So you start early on with tools for things like architecture and modeling. So you do um, uh, very early architecture modeling portions here. This is where you want to try out how your chip actually um, is partitioned, what do you put into hardware and software. You then have um, tools in the simulation space, which are RTL simulation, and those are different abstraction levels. So you can do this at the TLM level, you can do this at the RT level, which is more detailed, more accurate. You have, um, as part of this, you have equally important um, formal tools. So this is where you have formal verification, which applies to often the blocks, but also at the chip level to things like registers and so forth. From simulation, you go into emulation. So this is the emulation. This is not an EMU. Um, and you go to prototyping. do this like this, SimU, Mul, and Porto. And from here you go into production for the actual chip. So this is also roughly your, this is also roughly your timeline. Has, this, has any of this changed in terms of as we shifted left, has all this stuff always been there or is there, are there new pieces in there that didn't exist before? Well, all this stuff has always been there um, for different sub-use models, but at this point in time it's no longer optional to use prototyping. We see about 80% or more of the designs really using prototyping at the end of the day in FPGA, one or the other. And then especially for um, designs from a certain design size on, at this point really even from 8, 16, 24 million gates on, emulation becomes a necessity as well. And also because some of this can now be moved into the cloud and you can break things into pieces, can you now do things in different order than what you were doing before? Um, different order, not often, um, because you really have a dependency here on what you do where, and you add more detail as you go through it. But from a cloud perspective, 
especially when you go here into the emulation prototyping and simulation world, you actually have to go both directions. You develop from here, but then you find issues here, so you go back because you want to um, debug with more, um, with more uh, fidelity um, in the earlier engines. And also as you get into some of these AI chips, they're breaking those down into pieces primarily because A, you have lots of different components there. The accelerators may be different. You may be trying to accelerate one piece of something versus another. And also the algorithms change pretty regularly too, right? The algorithms change. So AI is a good example. Another one is graphics, right? So what you actually have is not only jump from engine to engine, but you will combine emulation and prototyping with TLM-based simulation for what we call hybrid execution because things like a GPU, things like core elements of your AI chip, you really want to keep at the accuracy but the high speed of emulation or prototyping. Um, but then some of the aspects can be kept at a higher level of abstraction using transaction level models. That's what we refer to as hybrids. If you go into an advanced packaging type of arrangement, does any of this change because now you, have, you can break things apart into different pieces? Uh, do you have to do this for every piece of it or do you have to do it for just some? No, it's, uh, it's actually um, a, an interesting trend that with packaging and multiple chips coming together, this is actually very well suited for multi-chip um, execution as well. You may have multiple chips even with an emulation, but for sure what you do in emulation, you have the actual chip and you have the chip's environment. So you have all the things it talk, uh, talks to, like, for example, MIPI components, Ethernet components, PCI Express components. So all of these um, you connect to the system and you emulate, prototype and simulate them over here. They are initially typically test benches here. They become physical or virtual interfaces on the emulation side and on the prototyping side as well. You're also taking in a lot of data. Are, is there more things you can do with that data than what you did before? There is um, a, an incredibly large amount of data being generated here um, as you simulate all this, as you execute all this. So you have, have to imagine each of those um, processes gets you a very big database of debug information which, um, brings to get, which comes out of all these engines. So what you want to do now, together with the, the data um, for debug down here, you want to make sure that you choose the right engines for the right execution. That's why over here, you actually have this notion of what we refer to as smart bug hunting, which includes things like smart debug, looking at the data. It also includes things like test bench um, generation. Um, that's what happens in the a portable stimulus type of environment where you have the same test bench now executing in different environments. Where do you see something like AI machine learning fitting into this? That's an interesting question. Some of it is uh, futures, but for example, in the formal verification world, we announced earlier this year how we actually train the engine selection by um, us having essentially um, AI machine learning to give the user um, suggestion and improve the choice of engines for formal verification. People are looking at things like, how do I order my regressions in uh, a most uh, feasible way? Uh, I'm presented on this in some, of their, uh, in some of their conferences, how I actually now can figure out how to get to coverage faster with a steeper curve. As you do begin deploying machine learning in this and you're looking for patterns, does that pattern now carry across multiple designs or is it design specific? And the reason I ask that is a lot of what we've come out with recently has been one-off type of custom designs, particularly at the most advanced nodes. Do the patterns carry over? Can you reuse those? Yeah, patterns definitely carry over. I mean, there are certainly single designs, as you mentioned, but. Uh, normally what you really see people planning for when they start their verification, so all this here has verification planning, test bench generation, um, uh, smart debug and so forth in it, 
um, when they plan their design, it's typically for multiple generations. So for example, um, initially when you look at your power um, uh, analysis, you may be fine with using the power um, from the previous chip, with use, applying real data, applying real measurements. But then as you get more accurate, you connect the emulation data to engines uh, from the implementation world like Joules to get from the technology data the more detailed power information deducted together with your activity data up here. And you can do this later in the, the process. So this will take into account previous chip data and then that becomes the foundation for next chip's data. So there is definitely um, pattern reuse, if you will, uh, for the next generation chip and from the previous generation chip. So is the goal here now, because you do have the, all these different engines, is the goal to improve the time to market or is it actually to improve your coverage? Um, it's a combination of those. So at the end of the day, the tape out is typically um, in most application domains dictated by the time when you have to ship. There is um, always a very pivotal point when you actually say, okay, we're ready to go to, um, we're ready to go to tape out at this point in time. It's a very pivotal point for the project manager because your confidence has to be there to actually be able to tape out. But you already know that you will never have really all the last bug all removed. A lot of them will then be worked around in software and you have um, errata in your chip and so forth. So um, it increases the confidence of when you can tape out, which is really driven from when you need to ship in most application domains. What it does increase is the quality and the confidence you have at that point in time to be able to tape out. And that's where the whole shift left comes in. So if all of this now has both the chip and the software, right? So if I look at the software coming in, the traditionally software um, being developed late here, once the chip is back, all these engines, especially prototyping, allows you to do software development much earlier. Emulation as well, but that's where you have interesting duality going on here between prototyping and emulation because in this phase, your design becomes more stable. You have a bug curve. Um, if you look at my, um, my bugs here in, re in a reddish color, I have um, over time a reduction of, of bugs, which hopefully when I tape out is at the end. I don't know where they went up there. I found more in that timeline. But um, I'm basically removing my bugs over time throughout my project. Here, my RTL is not quite as stable yet as it is here. So you can play with things like the bring up time here, the faster turnaround time, even more flexible um, uh, debug and simulation where you use a lot of behavioral code, very, very advanced debug and emulation, but then faster speed and prototyping. So you're balancing all these things off between performance, between uh, debug insight, and the ability to get the next rev of the um, design uh, running. Is there a feedback loop so that when you discover something in one place, it can be used somewhere earlier in the flow? Absolutely, especially when you have done the test bench generation using portable stimulus. This goes back and forth. Portable stimulus actually extends all the way to the, uh, to the chip here. You have your fast debug, your smart debug, which you have across the engines. You have a formal, um, which happens here, you, have, you use your verification IP and you use all this planning. So this planning is actually where everything comes together. You use coverage here, you get coverage here, you get coverage here. You bring it all together into this planning environment here with the um, test bench generation from here. And then the question becomes, what's my best engine to uh, debug all this? So if I find a, a defect somewhere in prototyping, I now may not want to use the prototyping facilities to debug. They are uh, improving in quality uh, all the time as well. But going back to emulation, especially with a combined flow, as users get from us, you can now bring this up in emulation and get better debug from there, or even hop back into simulation where you have uh, previous test benches and even more advanced debug capability. So thinking about this in terms of the complexity and some of the newness of, of some of these chips, you think about an AI chip versus an IoT chip, for example, 
If you get this all right, how much time can you save? Well, we see significant time savings really here. So the bring up of the chip, we now have people telling us, if you have done all this and your chip comes back from production, if all the test benches and if all the software bring up that you did earlier and all those hybrid uh, setups worked out well, you are within hours from the chip coming back. So we tell, have people telling us they got the chip back and two days later they had a first demo to uh, some of their key clients. So you can signif save significant time here and the whole hardware software integration, I mean what we refer to as shift left, so this shifting left goes all the way here into the simulation um, domain. So you get uh, a working model of your chip to be um, six months, nine months earlier, because you this phase here in itself uh, is typically um, at least a quarter or two until you get your samples, right? So until you get the final chip done. So you get significant time savings at the end in the bring up hardware and software and in quality by having this early integration. Now the interesting part is you had asked about application domains. The border at which some things become optional has become very low. In my fitness tracker design, four million gate, what have you, I may be able to skip simulation. I directly um, beam it into a prototyping board at the end. So I may not do full emulation because my cycle is slower, my complexity is lower. A lot of it can actually be done in simulation. But the barrier at which emulation, for example, has no longer, uh, is no longer optional today has become very, very low because you really need this early integration of hardware, software, and debug and run many, many sequences from a verification and hardware, software, debug perspective. So um, it's, um, it's really um, depending on the application domain whether some of these are optional. Customers often look at us and say, hey, um, at least when you um, we understand the need for all those different engines, but at least make it as seamless as possible for us from, to jump from one to the other, which is what we're doing, right? So these have the same front end. You take a design which runs in emulation and comes in, in prototyping very fast. You go back here, you use test benches with portal stimulus, which go across. So we are working towards making this whole process as seamless as possible. Frank Schermeister, thanks for a great explanation. Thanks for having me.